Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's um, Grand Round. Today is May 11, 2022, and our topic today is culture and language, humility and health and behavioral care. Really excited about hearing this first of a series of talks on culture and language humility in our patient population. Um, but before we get started, just a couple of things, um, housekeeping uh, things to clarify. Please feel free to put any questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. These will be answered at the end of the presentation. And I will um, be looking out for these questions throughout the grand rounds and answering what I can and holding the other ones for our guest lecturer. Um, also, finally, uh, if you're looking for CME credit, at the end of the grand rounds, you will be you will receive the link for the evaluation in order to uh, gain access to your CME points. Um, I want to get started, and this I want to say is a real privilege to join effort with Wilmont Cancer Center on this diversity talk. Um, I want to introduce to you today Paula Cupertino. She is a professor of public health sciences and oncology in Wilmont Cancer Institute's first associate director of community outreach, engagement, and disparities. Uh, Dr. Cupertino leads efforts to strengthen and expand Wilmont's research and connections across its 27 county uh, catchment area here in upstate New York. She's a social behavioral scientist and she has focused most of her research career on health disparity, uh, in particular in underserved minority communities uh, of Latinos. Much of her work has been dedicated to tobacco control and improving smoking cessation and access to cessation treatment using uh, a community-based approach. So without further ado, I would like uh, to present to you um, Dr. Cupertino, who will be presenting our uh, guest lecturers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Telvo Olivares. As the Associate Director of Wilmot Cancer Institute uh, for Communal Reach Engagement and Disparities, it's my pleasure to partner with the Department of Psychiatry and with the goal to increase awareness, our skills and knowledge, incorporating language access within our routine of care, our routine of activities within Wilmot. Uh, it is uh, a continuation of the February language access series uh, with the Department of Pediatrics in which Dr. Uh, pediatrician uh, John Cowden, a friend and a national leader on language access have given. And today is a follow-up in which we're gonna hear from Francisco Martinez on the implementation that Children's Mercy has implemented as a leader in this area in terms of the medical education and in working with diverse community addressing the language access. It is my total uh, pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. John Cowden uh, and welcome, here, welcome him here one more time to lead us in an important discussion uh, and share best practice, practice in language access. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cowden, for joining us. I am not sure if Dr. Cowden is with us at this moment. So um, I am uh, very enthusiastic to introduce Mr. Francisco Martinez, who works directly uh, in the implementation of Dr. Cowden's uh, expertise in diversity, equity, and inclusion related to uh, language access. And with that, I will uh, welcome uh, Mart uh, Francisco Martinez to share with us best practice implemented in Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you for joining us.
Thank you, Paula. I'm just trying to open my my screen. Hello, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon over there. Here is morning still. We're in Kansas City, and thank you for having me here today. And uh, it's an honor to be here and present to you. And I just want to say that I don't have any any uh, I don't have anything to declare. I don't have anything that I need to disclose. I am doing this because I love to share with everybody what we do at Children's Mercy. If you uh, would like to visit our webpage, uh, just take a picture of this QR code and you will, you will be able to open our uh, website at the Children's Mercy page. Um, you can also contact us. This is, uh, this is the email that we have that is like a general email. And uh, this is my email and, J and JC. We don't call him uh, John or Dr. Cowden. We call him JC. <laughs> it's a very flat, uh, uh, administrative uh, system that we use a, in our program. We're all partners. Okay, so uh, our presentation goals today are three presentation, three uh, main goals. First is a brief introduction of the program. Then the five leading outcomes of the program and the essential practices that we use to communicate uh, safe and, to and, 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 up to and get total communication with every patient that we see, not just the ones that speak Spanish. And uh, some, uh, we're going to share some of the lessons that we have learned through implementing this program. I wanted to introduce also the leading team of the program uh, that we call cultural and language, language coaching program. Uh, from left to right, you can see Dr. Jody Dickmeyer. She's the current director of the Clinica Hispana para Cuidados para la Salud or CHICOS. That's how we call our primary care uh, continuity clinic uh, in Kansas City in Children's Mercy. And she's the new director. We are in what we call the CHICOS version three. <laughs> Uh, me in the middle, and you can see JC Cowden. He is the director of the of the program, and I'm the manager and lead uh, coach of the program. I am the lead uh, coach in the bilingual residency at Children's Mercy. So our first goal is the brief introduction of the cultural language coaching program. And I'm going to do a brief history, okay? The, this started with the seed, of, the seed of an idea that came from JC. Uh, JC, after his own bilingual residency, realized that he had a number of concerns. Uh, and if given the opportunity, he would make the needed changes to address and solve these, these problems that he observed. The first thing that he observed is that there was a double standard related to language because you have to take a lot of exams in English to prove that you can be a doctor and provide the service in that language, right? But there was no formal testing of language ability for any other language that you would, uh, that you would provide the services or the care in any, in, uh, in any, place, right? So there, were, there, was, there was none by the time that he finished his, his uh, own um, program. And also he realized that there was no formal training for, for providers. There was nobody that he can go to ask questions, uh, cultural questions, language, call, language questions, nothing. He was uh, basically surviving and swimming in this uh, river of the stream by himself. So he was ready to change that. So when he came to Children's Mercy in Kansas City, he asked them if he would be, if they would be willing to invest in a, in a Hispanic clinic where they could have uh, or in train bilingual residents. So that's how it started Chicos almost 12 years ago. That was version one. And it was a very simple idea. Uh, Chicos uh, was going to provide uh, in visit support of learner and family. The, the original coaches were going to be only a safety net that assure complete and accurate communication and a coach that gives feedback to the learner and improve linguistic and cultural abilities. 
<clears throat> but this was not perfect because the original coaches were interpreters that obviously after visiting, uh, after doing a visit with a, a Chico's bilingual resident, they will have to go to the next visit. So they have very limited time and there was no formal structure. But that was the Chico's version one, right? But it was better than not having anything. Also, one of the other component is that the attendings, which it was only himself, would uh, also receive uh, all the information of the visit in Spanish from the from the from the residents. Then, uh, when I started working with uh, with. Chicos, in 2016, we formalized the program and we also had time to expand the program into the community and we created the second branch that is Adelante. Adelante is, uh, or Adelante Kansas City, which is cultural language coaching in behavioral healthcare settings. And we started with, uh, in 2017, uh, with support from Rich Healthcare Foundation, that is the original founder of our program in the community. And they were able to pay 20% of my time. And we started in with one uh, community partner with three learners. The second year, uh, I went to 10% of my time pays and 20% of a second coach that will go with or stay with the first organization. And we will look for a second organization. By the third year, we had two full-time coaches and we were searching for the third partner. But then uh, obviously, the pandemic hit and we had to stop a little bit. <laughs> but we continue working with, all, with, with the organizations that we had already partnered with. We even were able to coach the, to coach the organizations in how to use uh, digital platforms to, to provide telehealth and tele, teletherapies, everything that they needed to do because we already had the know-how. Like uh, we were already offering a little bit of telecoaching because uh, we were trying to, do, to, to introduce it into more areas of the hospital. So we were already uh, familiar with Teams and with Zoom and with other things. So once the pandemic hit and they asked us to re work remotely, we started day one <laughs> working remotely with everybody. Uh, also this, this opportunity helped us to, to collaborate with philanthropy and the innovation offices at Children's Mercy. Uh, who have helped us continue sponsorship uh, this branch uh, that continues growing. Uh, some of our, our sponsors, uh, like one of the of the main sponsors, has also been Signa. They they sponsor uh, the part of my time to create the train the trainer program uh, because what we wanted when we started this program in the community was to create also sustainability for the organizations that would participate in it. So we wanted to also train local coaches so they can so they can provide the service. So basically, basically um, everything was similar, right? It was one-on-one -on -one coaching of the bilingual providers. We then we started also agency coaching that was uh, how to approach the community in a dignified and culturally appropriate way. We also the, uh, helped them to create a, a real recruitment and retention program because uh, before we started, like if you said that you could speak Spanish, then they just hire you. And now they have a system where they have to vet these, these candidates and they have to prove that they can actually speak Spanish without the need of an interpreter. And it's also a retention tool because now these organizations offer to the public or to the, to the potential uh, recruits that they have a coach that can go with them so they can improve their Spanish and their cultural, uh, the cultural knowledge when, while they are working at the, at the center. So that has been something that attracts more uh, Spanish speaking uh, candidates to the centers. We also, uh, one of the main reasons to create uh, the cultural language coaching program was to professionalize language use and that's what we also, like through these recruitment and retention uh, protocols, we want them to understand that that's the correct way to do it because the families can benefit better if they, if they uh, understand everything and they uh, understand not only the language, but also the culture. Um, and we have to do it through exams, all right? But obviously, as we said, like there wasn't none for uh, clinicians until Alta created a, a validated test. 
And, uh, and now we're trying to do the same thing with uh, this area. So it was also a pipeline for providers because some of them, like, as I said, like they became coaches. So now they have dedicated time to coach also and, and do all this recruitment and retention in their own centers. Uh, we also, uh, it was also an opportunity to create a network of bilingual providers and agencies. And we have created a, a community of practice among them. We have a monthly meeting where uh, all the organizations and some guests come and share uh, experiences with Spanish or share the, the, the uh, services and benefits and, and resources that they have that they offer. Because uh, we realized uh, at the beginning, uh, for, uh, serving the community that everybody was working in silos and many of them were doing same similar things and they could benefit from collaborating with each other. So this has been great. And we have, uh, we have uh, now partners in both Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri, because you have to know that Kansas City is not just one city, but two cities in two different states separated by a river, the Missouri River. <laughs> So uh, we have now, we have now uh, agencies in both sides of the river and also they collaborate a lot with each other. So now we are sharing all the events that everybody is, uh, is doing individually and we share all this information. And I think the attendance has improved and satisfaction of clients has also improved. And uh, the last thing that goes uh, along the lines of professionalization of the language is that we created a test uh, partnering with language line solutions, uh, we created a, a test that is more um, competence based for, uh, well, it's not only one test, it's two tests because one is for service coordinators and the other one is for therapists. So these are like in this uh, few years working with uh, this partnership and in this new branch, the, 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 the things that we have achieved. And uh, well, I already mentioned that we did the coach training and uh, we have, uh, originally we, we, we piloted with three candidates and uh, they completed it. Two were inserted in the community partners that we had in that time and one went uh, a different way. Now we have trained two more coaches that, uh, or we have coached three more coaches basically that have, uh, that have been like those uh, full-time coaches that we have now in the program. And now we are finishing also uh, training uh, a language uh, access services from Children's Mercy, uh, an interpreter that works for uh, language access services. And he's going to be part-time coach and part-time interpreter. So uh, our current partners in Kansas City in this program in Atlanta KC are Mary Roads Center, that is the original center, PACES, that means Parents, Adolescents, and Children Emotional Services. From Porch Alliance that serves uh, an underserved community, community and they are realizing that they have more and more Spanish speakers in that area in Kansas City, Missouri. Safe Home that provides uh, shelter and also services, uh, uh, services for uh, victims or uh, so, sorry, uh, survivors of uh, domestic violence. We started also uh, a new um, collaboration with North Kansas City Schools, where we're going to train uh, the um, student services uh, people how to how to uh, work uh, culturally correctly with uh, families that speak uh, Spanish and other languages, and in general with everybody, because communication can improve uh, all these relationships, no matter uh, the language. And we also work with the Children's Mercy Development and Behavioral Clinic, uh, training uh, bilingual uh, psychologists and also social workers. And finally, what I just mentioned that we have a new program with language access services and Children's Mercy, where we're going to uh, have uh, part-time coaches, interpreters, uh, dual role uh, employees that are going to support the, not only the bilingual clinic, but also other clinics outside and the research institute, probably. Okie dokie, so uh, I'm going to talk now about the, the program and the components in Chicos. In Chicos, uh, our curricula includes weekly coaching. So the residents come one afternoon uh, uh, every week 
And we have uh, currently 18, 18, uh, 18 residents in the program at different levels of proficiency, uh, but we start with uh, at least intermediate communicative conversational Spanish. So they don't, they, they can uh, have at least a simple conversation, social conversation with the families. And then through the years, through the three years of the residency, they can improve all the communication and the cultural uh, awareness and understanding of the families that they see. So in this, in this weekly coaching, the coach observes and serves as a safety net during actual visits in Spanish. And the second component of this weekly coaching is that the coach and the attending doctors provide individual instruction and feedback to residents in, tar in the target language. The next aspect of the curricula is that we have created a, a manual de español pediátrico para residentes. So is, this is a Spanish pediat uh, pediatric Spanish for the residents. And here I'm going to do a little zoom. So you can see we have compiled 42 of the most the, uh, the most typical visit that we observe here in Kansas City in the pediatric care uh, clinic. So it's obviously with development and, and growth and development because they are going to see a lot of newborns in, uh, all the way to, to their teens, right? So that's the first thing that they need to learn. And these are also the topics that uh, happen by season. So the first season when they start is a lot of otitis media, right? A lot of the sport physicals. Uh, asthma, eczema, uh, anemia, and then we have a little bit of the uh, the, the, the TDA, TDHA that is the ADDH basically, right? AADA. So uh, we also have uh, obesity, uh, all kinds of different things, okay? And we have separated this in two parts. Uh, I'm going to so. Um, We have divided this in two parts. The first one is the cultural cl uh, clinical cultural pearls that are both in English and Spanish because it's the minimum knowledge that they have to have as residents to treat or, or diagnose these, these conditions. And then totopos con salsa, we call it totopos con salsa, that is chips with salsa, but totopos is the real Mexican word for it. <laughs> Not chips, we call them totopos. <laughs> and it's just a little snack because it's a, a, it's a a small uh, part of, a, of, a, of an article that has been published by uh, the Mexican Academy of Pediatrics or the Argentine uh, Academy of Pediatrics or any other international Hispanic academics. And then if they want, they can explore more, but they also uh, are presented with uh, the vocabulary that is more technical because the doctors are told us like, we learn to speak to the families in plain language and learn to communicate using their own words and everything. But if we want to present in a conference, what, how can we learn that? So that's the second part for it. So they can learn more academic and, and uh, formal medical language in pediatrics. In the last, in the last, uh, aspect or the last item of this curricula is a monthly, a monthly session uh, for lectures or simulations that we have, and we call it enlaces, which means links. And enlaces chicos provides a space for, uh, for bilingual pediatric specialist practice, uh, for cultural issues and for communication. We have a guest here from the special, from the special, uh, special clinic that we have. And that's uh, the, the kind of presentation that we have. It's an hour, uh, once a month. But we also, when we, don't have, uh, when we don't have guests, then we have an opportunity to practice simulated visits in a safe learning space. And we do a lot of the things that we want them to do, like identify like health literacy, uh, practice cultural community in order to, 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 to use their skills of cultural knowledge and also to practice use of plain language and uh, the use of, of teach back, which are like the, the pillars of what we do. So now we're going to start the second part, which is our leading outcomes. This is what guides us to, to, to do what we do. So I want to start with the cultural language coaching mission and vision. This is something that JC and I sat down to create in 2019. 
And uh, this is what we came out with. Our vision is better communication, healthier, healthier individuals and stronger communities. And our mission is to increase the bilingual healthcare workforce that can safely and effectively support the Spanish speaking community. Our five leading outcomes in the cultural language coaching program. First is health and behavioral care access in preferred language other than English by direct care uh, uh, or direct care by providers on, on site. The second one is to uh, establish a qualified bilingual staff policy to ensure safe and complete communication in every visit, including collaborations with interpreters. And I want to thank the interpreters today. They are doing a great job. Thank you, Val, uh, right now, and, uh, and Alex. Also improved active involvement of patients and their families or caregivers in their own care. This is one of the most important uh, members of the team and we want them to feel that way. That will all obviously create better outcomes for all patients and clients. And we're going to empower patients, clients, clients and families and, or caregivers through education collaborations in as many care visits as possible. So straight to part three. What are our essential practices and the lessons that we have learned through doing this? So the first essential practice in cultural and language coaching is that we need to offer the service as trauma-informed care. This is very important. These are, the, according to the definition of the SAMSHA, uh, the six key principles are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, and empowerment through voice and choice and cultural, historical, and gender issues. This is to create a, work, a workplace environment that respects people's experience and manages the, the incidence of re-traumatization. Why is this important? Okay. Most families that speak a foreign language and is their preferred language of service bring an uh, immigration trauma. Immigration itself uh, creates trauma. Even the, even if, if I don't know, like in, in the community, in the, in the Latino community, you know that most, uh, a lot of the families that come or people that come to the United States, they don't do it by choice. They are forced to do it by different uh, situations that are going through in their, pro, in, in their own countries. And they have to go through more than three or four uh, different borderlines and in each country they are going to suffer different different situations that are going to create really stress and trauma and even if you just immigrate for example in in my case i consider myself i don't even consider myself an, an immigrant because i was invited to come to this country to work for a university and teach but it's still a trauma because there are a lot of things that I don't understand about the American culture, even though I thought I knew the, the American culture because I, I, I learned English from a young age and, and have friends, but it's not the same as living here. There are too many things that are super different uh, in our cultures in, in services and in all different uh, areas. For example, I'm used to, to go to the doctor just when something is broken and here, uh, care is preventive. So that caused trauma to me. Another thing is like my doctor never talked to me. It was all, always the nurse. And I was like, hey, doctor, I'm here. You can talk to me. <laughs> but no, it didn't happen. So, and I was used to friends. So there's that cultural shock, right? Like there's cultural shock because there are so many things that they don't, that we don't have in the countries that we, that we come from. Uh, culture shock in terms also of just even speak a foreign language, right? Like you are always thinking like, if I go there and there's no interpreters or how, are, how much are the interpreters going to cost? Because a lot of people don't know that this is a right and that is free, the service is free, right? And uh, so in, there's also the cultural shock that here, the, the healthcare is also collaborative with, with the patients and their, and their families. And in our culture is, no, you're the doctor, you know everything. You have to tell me what I need to do and I will just do it because I don't know. And I don't dare to ask you questions because I don't know anything, right? So, so that's also part of that culture shock. 
then the next thing that we need to consider is also the social cultural background of immigrants because like we need to we need to understand that they are not doctors they are not uh, nurses and many times they may not even be literate a lot of the a lot of the people that immigrate to the united states come from uh, backgrounds that are also marginal in their own countries so there may not there may not have access to education so we need to consider that in order to be able to communicate correctly with them and to understand what uh, how can we help them educate themselves to, so they can take uh, better care of themselves, their families, and, and also uh, just to improve their health and understanding of how the, the system works here in the United States. So we need to do that with compassion and patience because we want to create that, that workplace environment, right? That, that is going to create voice and choice for the families and the patients that you're going to see or the clients that you're going to see. Uh, and these are words that you're going to, to, to hear a lot uh, here in my presentation, compassion and, pa and patience. And the last thing that we need to assume in trauma-informed is our own assumptions, because many times we assume that the person that is in front of us understands and knows the system or understands and knows that there are resources in the community that they can use, but that's not true. That's not true. Like uh, we, have, we have had experiences with families that uh, have children with obesity and with uh, obesity and we ask them, oh, just take them to the community center and run and do this and do that. But these families don't even know that they have that, that opportunity to use a community center or a YMCA or that there are things that they don't even need to pay that much for that, right? Or we ask them to do all these things, but do we know if they have transportation? Do we know that they have, that both parents work at the times that these centers are open or not? So all of these are assumptions that we make because we, we, are, we are thinking about like the, the average people in America, but not of people that have other conditions and other circumstances. So we also need to keep in check our own assumptions to, to give a better service. The second essential practice that we, uh, that we use is patient-centered care. Okay, and here I'm going to give you a definition from the Institute of Medicine is that providing care that is, is patient care or center care is, is providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. So it's not what I think is, is what they prefer, like what, that, what they value as important for their care. We really need to consider that uh, because that's the only way that we can eliminate that power relationship See, there, we can provide balance by accepting cultural values, cultural traditions in healthcare and behavioral care. That's the only way that we can break that barrier and they can open to, to share with us what they really want or need or can do. Because also remember that there are things that they may not be able to do. Uh, again, <laughs> we, have to, we have to use compassion and empathy to work with these families, uh, to, to, to offer real patient care, uh, center care. The next thing is like, we have to do it with sincerity. It, it cannot be a script uh, that many times uh, it happens. Like it's, it's kind of like we learn things as a script and then we don't leave that script. We don't show our real uh, feelings. And when we do this with sincerity, the families and your patients will, will see that you are really interested in their culture, in what they value, in what they need. And they're going to, to be also sincerely uh, grateful for that. So you listen actively and patiently. One of the, one of the uh, uh, more advanced communication, uh, communicative skills that you can get is learn to take turns. And it may not happen in, in many care uh, settings because you are time constrained, right? So uh, many times when you ask questions and you start listening to the, to, the, to the answer, like many doctors know what the answer is going to be and they cut the families or, or the patients and they just go to the next question. And among the Hispanic community, 
that is very rude because you asked me a question and I want to give you an answer, but then you cut my answer. So, so just learn to listen, just learn to be present and you're going to achieve uh, a lot of those health goals that, that you want to, to provide and work with your patients and clients. Also treat the person, not the condition. The person is more than just the condition that they come with. They come with, uh, as we said, like socioeconomic problems uh, with a lot of burdens, with a lot of trauma, with a lot of cultural shock. So, and it's not going to happen in one visit, right? Like you, you cannot create these relationships in only one visit. It has to be uh, visit after visit. As we said, in as many visits, there has to be those collaborations. So little by little, you, you uh, destroy those barriers in communication and trust. And little by little, you're going to see better results and more communication and more, and more uh, empathy or, or synergies between you and your clients and patients. The next, the next essential uh, practice in cultural language coaching is the use of plain language that I already talked a little bit about it. In plain language is grammatically correct language, okay? It includes complete sentences, structure, accurate word usage. It's not a method of dumbing down or talking down to the reader. That is just condescending and families, patients, everybody is going to understand that. They are going to see that like, oh, you're trying to dumb it down. It's not speaking louder. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's none of that. It's speak well, but with plain words, with words that even a, a kid in fifth grade will understand. We know that from the studies, right? That's most of the people that come to, to, to uh, medical care or uh, uh, psychological or behavioral care are going to be in a fifth grade, uh, in a fifth grade uh, understanding or uh, head literacy. So, but just try to, to find words that are simpler to understand. So the use of uh, plain language avoids creating barriers and also, also destroy the barrier of that uh, power relationship. That's why the, the, that's why the family is like, how can I correct you or tell you something if you are over here and I don't understand what you're saying, right? Like, so that shows me that you are more powerful than me. But if you, uh, it, it's, it's almost like in pediatrics, they tell you when you talk to your, to your little patient, like uh, sit down, uh, look at them at their eyes, like put yourself at their level. And you have to do the same thing with language that talk, to their level, to, to, to the level of the families. Remember, they are not they are not doctors. So we all know now that words are powerful. Uh, I have I have I I play sports and I was very rough as a child and I have a bunch of, of uh, scars, right? But I see at them and I, I see them and I say like, ah, okay, scars, no problem. But things that my parents told me or friends told me that hurt me, oh boy they still hurt, they still hurt. So words are powerful and words, when we use it in a positive way, are also powerful in the opposite direction. They are going to create positive results. So that's, that's the, the magic of using plain language and, 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 and being able to communicate completely with, uh, with your patients and clients. Because without communication, we cannot expect any results or at least not the positive ones, right? Uh, we can expect that there are not, not going to be results and that is negative. And there's a lot of science and advances in medicine and in behavioral care uh, that you can understand and read when you read the articles, but you need to do that transference into the practice world so the families can also understand and benefit from all this science and you can save lives, you can touch lives in a way just by changing the way you, 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 you speak to the families. Uh, and we see also this transformation in our program because the first year residents, they are fresh from school. So they are used to talk to, to their, their, uh, their professors and also other, other doctors or in other, in other students of medicine. So they are used to also speaking in that doctorate language 
and using acronyms or initials. And when you talk using initials uh, with the families, the families are going to be totally lost, right? So also always spell everything. Don't, don't use acronyms or initials because families probably won't understand or understand something totally different, right? So using plain language, you also help your patients educate themselves on the road to healthcare empowerment because you are giving them tools that they understand to work the system, to work with the system and to, to improve their, 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 their outcomes. And also empower everyone in the care team by using plain language, you're not only empowering your patients, you're empowering your, your access care, uh, your um, care assistants, your nurses, your lactation uh, specialists, your respiratory therapist, everybody that works uh, along with you in the team is going to be empowered if, if you just plain language and explain things in a way that everybody understands. And the same thing in the behavioral care, like uh, the, the people who do like the, 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 the first screenings, they will understand better how to do their job. The, the, the families are going to know and understand exactly what they are going to receive in their next visits and what kind of therapy they are going to need, what kind of resources they are going to be able to get when they go to your, to your centers. But it has to be like a team effort. Like they say, like, you know, that, that old saying, right? It takes a village. So this is the same thing. And use, this is what we define, like the use of plain language for us is language humility because language humility demonstrates that you want to work with the person that is in front of you. Remember that Spanish is spoken in many different countries and with different levels of education. And there are also like something, a concept that is known as like the um, languages with, um, languages that are more, um, how can we say it? Uh, that are, that have more, um, that, are, that people, enjoy more just because they think they, they are like more elegant or, or more sophisticated, right? So, but, but actually language is a tool to communicate. So uh, in our program, we are not uh, against like mirroring what the family tells you. So, because also the families are going to learn a lot of the words of the, of the health system in English, not in Spanish, because they might not have any services in Spanish. So when they receive the first clinical services or their first behavioral care uh, services are going to be in English and they're going to understand and learn it in Spanglish because that's what they're going to use, all right? So for example, they are going to ask you for refills, not for a new receta de las medicinas. So that is a that, that is a, 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 a that is the prescription. <laughs> Sorry, and uh, they are not they are not going to tell you they are not going to tell you things like um, I leave my kids I leave my children with uh, with a niñera which is a babysitter. They are going to tell you that they they are going to live with the babysitter because that's a word that they learn here. They didn't have access to babysitters in 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 their original countries. They have family, extended family, they have friends, they have neighbors. And that is the that was the network that they used to have. Here you don't have that network, so you have to hire somebody, and that would be a babysitter. Here in Kansas City, they say baby city, and we use that word with them, like so you leave them with the baby city. So <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. We are communicating with them. So that is also what we understand as lang language. Uh, humility. And the fourth practice is, uh, and this is the most important one, teach back. Teach back, and this is a, a, from the National Institutes of Health, the teach back method is a way of checking understanding by ask, asking patients to state in their own words what they need to know or do about their health. And it is a way to confirm that you explain things in a manner your patients understand. This is the most powerful tool that you can use in every single visit. And it doesn't mean that you have to do it only with people who speak a foreign language or when you have an interpreter, you have to do it every time, every single time, 
this is why I'm telling you this. A lot of the residents asked me, I don't know if the family understood what I said. And I told them, and how can you make sure that they understand? And then they always go, oh, teach back. <laughs> yeah, so everybody now is receiving, uh, is receiving training in teach back, even in schools, uh, at least here in Kansas City, we know that they, they take uh, classes that include teach back and, and head literacy, use of plain language, but we don't use it all the time. There are studies already out there that have told us or indicated that we don't use teach back all the time. So what is the solution? We must use speech back all the time. So how do we get in the habit to do it? Okay, so you're always like, as a pediatricians are always telling their families and their patients, why don't you have a chart where you are going to, uh, if I did this behavior, I'm going to, uh, like if my child did this behavior, I'm going to have like a little sticker there when they complete the stickers, I'm going to give them a prize, right? Or, or a reward. We could do something similar. <laughs> we, can, we can have a chart for ourselves where, where we are tracking how many times today I use stitch back. Did I do, did I do it right? Did I, uh, or did I miss an opportunity? And that little by little is going to, is going to create that change. Uh, cultural language coaches uh, in that sense are like the Jiminy Christmas of the residents because we are the little crickets that is always telling them, you stitch back, you stitch back, you stitch back. <laughs> okay, so that, that's how we, we, we achieve that. And the attendings are also telling them like, eh, how many times did you do teach back today? Okay, if you do that, like we have also that little chart where we have the, the, the little rewards. So when we complete that chart, everybody in one day of the clinic, then we go and eat tacos or we go and have something that we really like. I don't know, it's chocolate time. So one of the, one of the great places and times uh, when you can do teach back is when you do discharge in, the, in, in any clinical setting, or even when you do the discharge in behavioral care, because that's where you can uh, try to, try to uh, uh, ask the families or the patients what they understood and how they understood it. So it's always like, you always have to say like, I'm sorry, I give you a lot of information and I would really like to know if uh, everything was uh, well explained. So can you tell me your own words? What are you going to do at home? Uh -huh. and, and they start and if they, if they are right, you make a big fiesta, right? And throw a lot of, a, a lot of balloons and clap and, and celebrate because, oh my God, you are a great patient. You're a great client. You, um, you really got everything that I told you. And if not, then there's an opportunity to correct that, right? This is the chance when, when there's a deviation from what you were uh, teaching or what you were uh, trying to explain, then you can correct it by saying also like, oh, sorry, I didn't do a good job. I didn't do a good job explaining that part. Let's do it little by little. Let's go through every step and we're going to check, if, like in your own words, you will tell me what you're going to do step by step. And that's a great opportunity to do it and continue doing it. And finally, what we have learned is that families will surprise you. Families will surprise you so much. Uh, we have a, uh, we have a, a, a good community of Mixteco families here in Kansas City. Mixtecos are, uh, it's a regional uh, group, uh, ethnic group that uh, lives in the, in the Pacific coast and in Oaxaca areas in Mexico. And it's the, it's the second most, uh, it's, the, it's the largest indigenous original language in Mexico with 1.6 million speakers of, of Mixteco. But there are different, there are different variations or different uh, dialects of it. And they prefer to use Spanish in the visits because, because of that reason, when you try to find an interpreter is usually not in the same, in the same uh, dialect. So they prefer Spanish, but they don't speak Spanish very fluently. But when we use teach back with these families, it's amazing because they can explain in very simple ways what they are going to do. 
and we do it two or three times. And this is a this is an actual experience. Uh, we have this mom that we were working with and her baby, and we didn't do it like the fourth time that she visited us when uh, after the baby was born. The, in the fourth visit, when we were leaving, the mom says, "Hey, doc, you're not going to ask me what I'm going to do at home." So she was doing her own. She was doing her own teach back because they realized that that was a powerful tool that they can use to understand and, and, and get praises also from the doctor, right? So that was a great experience. I almost cried when I, when I had that experience, but I'm a crying baby. So the, the last uh, essential practice is cultural humility to continue achieving cultural competency. Uh, in this article from the cultural competence of or uh, cultural competence or cultural humility, moving beyond the debate by Green, Moton, and Minkler, they uh, use this definition from the original uh, creators of cultural humility, Turbulon and Maury Garcia, that define culture, cultural humility as a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and critique, to redressing power imbalances, and to and for developing mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic partnerships with communities on behalf of individuals and defined populations. Okay, and, uh, and there's a lot of debate on, uh, is it cultural humility or cultural awareness and cultural competency? And for us, like what we have learned is that they are not in conflict. They are not in conflict because they are the approach Cultural humility is the approach, the strategy that you have to, to use your attitude to acquire the knowledge. And then cultural competency is the skills that you acquire when you, when you uh, finally use cultural humility and cultural, uh, cultural uh, competence uh, or awareness. So we always have to think about attitude, knowledge, and skills in attitude, as I said, will be the cultural humility. You acquire that, land, that knowledge, and then you can use your skills with that knowledge that you have. So you can achieve the, be the best results. We also need to consider that the competency, com like cultural competency changes because culture change, language change, and people change. You're not going to see the same people all the time. You're not going to see the same cultures. And even the culture, like, uh, if you come from a different country, but you start living here and through the years, you're going to develop a different culture because you are mixing with people from all over the world and, and locals and, and you're going to see doctors and nurses and, and, and psychologists and people that didn't, that, did, that were not in your cultural circle. Now they are going to be in your cultural circle. And that is going to change also the person that is in front of you. So we have to change with them and learn and grow with them. That's, that's uh, something super important. And one of the things that we need to, to consider is that cultural competency allows you, allows you to learn with compassion. I want to share uh, an example that, uh, of one of our residents who is going to graduate pretty soon. Uh, and uh, her name is Dr. Kira McCarthy. She uh, shared with us that thanks to what she has learned uh, in the program, she was able to identify uh, this situation. Uh, she was in one of the, in one of the inpatient uh, uh, rotations and uh, they, were going to, they were going to headline this family because they realized the mother was not giving the treatments for this, uh, for this baby that had very serious hormonal deficiencies. So it was very important that the treatments, because they were different treatments for different complex situations uh, needed to be provided and she was not doing it. So they were just going to, to hotline this family. And uh, she said, okay, I understand that this family speak Spanish or speak a different language, right? And we haven't asked them if they have any barriers to, to care. So she said, like, is it okay if I go and talk to this family? 
So she called an interpreter because she wanted to make sure that everything was understood. She called the, the interpreter and she went and also with a social worker, I think. So with her questions and with the way she treated the mom, the mom informed her, I didn't want to talk to the doctors because I didn't trust them. And she learned that this, uh, this family, the father had been detained by ICE, taken to California to be deported. And while in California, he had an accident and right now is in coma. This, this mother also told her that she has a 17 year old that is the kid that stays at home to take care of the baby. But obviously 70 year old cannot be expected to be a, a responsible caregiver, right? Especially because they also have their own responsibilities and life. And then uh, she asked, so how are you providing the medicine? And she said, well, I give it at four. And she said like a four in the afternoon, four in the morning. And she said like both because I have to go to work at four and I come back home at four in the morning. And she said, okay, so you give the medicine when you leave and when you come. And she said like, when I leave, yes, but when I come back, sometimes I'm so tired that I fall asleep and I cannot give the medicine. So I, I, I just keep it because I don't, I'm so tired. So she was able to identify all these factors that were cultural, socioeconomic barriers to what she could do. She talked to the mom and said like, hey, can we create, uh, can we create this chart? So you, like, if you don't give the medicine, your other daughter can give the medicine if she doesn't see that you mark this chart. And so she thought about ways to support and help this family before they were headlined. When she came back to talk to the rest of the group, she said, I don't think we need to headline. This is, there are too many barriers and I would not recommend to headline. We need to give them a chance and, and, and support them. So that was, uh, the, and she, and, and then she told us like, and I wouldn't have done any of this if I hadn't been in Chicos because you guys told me about cultural humility, use of plain language and identify those barriers. Hi, so, Paco. We are, you know, getting, you know, we have two minutes for you to share your final take home message. This has been wonderful, but unfortunately, we won't have time for Q&A, but we know where to find you and we'll continue to look for opportunities to connect. Definitely. Yes. So, so my last reflection is that uh, this is uh, the uh, Reconstruction uh, of the panel of the Triumph of Titus. Titus was one of the emperors of Rome after, after uh, Nero. And in the Triumph, you can see that there's, uh, there's the emperor, right? And he is in his quadriga and he has this Nike, uh, which is the uh, Victoria, right? Like the, the victory goddess. But actually it was not a goddess. It was just a person telling him while he was, what they were holding that crown of olives. Like, remember that you're mortal. Remember that you're just human. So don't let this go into your head. You have to be humble. And that was through the whole parade. So they remember that even though they were emperors, they were just a, a person like anybody else. And finally, also a quote from, so, uh, from uh, Richard Gawamis, Ga Ga uh, Indian Horse. Uh, this is from a, net, a, a film that is in Netflix, but it's also a, a novel from this Canadian author. And uh, in, in this one, uh, Soul Indian Horse is the main character. He says, my grandmother referred to the universe as the great mystery. Mystery fills us with awe and wonder. It is the foundation of humility and humility is the foundation of all learning. We cannot learn if we don't humble ourselves. So thank you very much. I'm sorry it took longer than I expected, but I had too many things to share with you guys. Thank you, Paco. That was great. Uh, really, I, I wish we had had time for questions, but I know you're going to meet a group of learners next, and I'm sure some of those questions will be asked there. Uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken to be with us today, and we wish everybody well. Everybody in the Q&A link, you will find the link to the CME and evaluation. Please feel free to um, click on it and give us an evaluation of this program. Thank you, um, Francisco. Thank you, Paula. Um, and we'll see you at the next meeting, Paco. Thank you. Have Bye -bye. a great day.